Amen. Well, it's great seeing everybody here uh, today. Uh, and you, you missed out on the excitement of the last service. Right there at the beginning of the service, we lost all the electric. So we held an old-fashioned, it wasn't even a candle-lit service. We didn't even have candles. How do you like that one? But uh, we had pretty much a full church, and uh, it was good. But uh, that's kind of a normal thing that happens up. We were, we were just talking about this over the last two weeks of coming up with a plan uh, when the electric goes up, but I think we were a couple weeks too late, but we're getting there. All right, well, we're starting a whole new series, uh, and this series is a little different. What, what we're going to do for three weeks, we're going to stay in the book of Proverbs right there. We're, we're not going to any other verses in the Bible. We're just going to stay right there. We're looking... Uh, at 90% of these verses, uh, Solomon wrote those verses. Solomon was one of the richest men who ever lived upon the face of the earth. And what he had to say about money. You know, this reminded me, there were these two guys. They were on a yacht. They were having a great time. And, and all of a sudden, the storm came up, and, and their yacht sank. And they became shipwrecked on this deserted island. Well, the one guy, I mean, he was just like freaking. He's all worried, and he's pacing, he's all nervous. Well, the other guy, he's just laying on the beach, and he's soaking up the sun. So his nervous friend said, hey, I, like, I, don't, I don't get this. Like, here we are, we're, we're abandoned on this island. He goes, aren't you in fear that the search crews are, like, going to give up on us? And his friend stood up and said, well, I, you know, I never told you this before, but I actually give my church $100,000 a year. So don't worry. Wherever I am, my pastor will find me. <laughs> There's some of you I would be on the search party for. <laughs> All right, here we go. Most of us aren't going to be, uh, aren't, aren't that blessed there. But uh, let's go to the next slide here. I want you to say this with me. Everyone here and at the cafe, okay, less is more, stress is bad, giving is good, tomorrow matters. I, I think all of us agree with this. So we're going to look at four points here today, four words of advice from the book of Proverbs from Solomon. And the first one is go to school. Now, I, I put go on each one of these because I, I believe in solving a problem. There's got to be a little action here. And let's do this. Everyone stand down at the cafe and up at the church. And let us all read out loud this next, this verse here. Proverbs 23, 23, everyone. Okay, buy truth and do not sell it. Buy wisdom, instruction, and understanding. All right, you may be seated. Okay, don't sell out on truth. Uh, do we know people who have sold out in truth? Do we know politicians who have sold out in truth? Do we know people that make money in ways they shouldn't be make money? They sold out in truth. We know family members. They now are agreeing with something that's absolutely immoral according to the word of God. But now they think it's okay because their family member does that. They've sold out in truth. Okay, but there's even a deeper meaning here. It says buy truth. How, how do you buy truth? Go get some training. Uh, all of our young people, when you're done with high school, go get training. I, I don't care if you do it. Because you want, to, you, you want to be an electrician, you want to be a, a, a plumber, you want to be um, a carpenter. Those are all great and wonderful careers. And, and just so you know, some of those careers that a lot of people look at as being like a blue-collar career, some of our largest givers, some of the people that do the, the best with their finances are in those careers. Okay, then we have these professions. They, I don't care if it takes 12 years. I don't care if it takes four years. I, it could take two years. It may take one year. I don't care if you're the baker. Uh, what's the next one? The baker? The candlestick maker or whatever it is. <laughs> or anything in between. I, listen, find something to do and do it well. Become a professional at what you do and do it to the best of your ability. The worst thing that you can do as a young man, young woman, and I got a ton of adults who will agree with me on this, is when you get out of high school and there's that shiny job out there and you see the dollar signs and they say, hey, you know, you're 19 years old, 
and you can come and work for us for $18 an hour. And you go, that's it? I'm not going to get training. I'm going to go and work there. Before you do anything, you want to see the end at the beginning. I would rather take a job that paid this much. But as the years went on, I saw that this would be best for me and my financial security. Then go ahead and take a good paying job right now at this moment. So we just want to step that up. Let us get some training. Go to school. Okay, uh, next of all, number two, go make a plan. Go make a plan. Proverbs 21, verse 5. The plans of the diligent. Let's stop there. The diligent, the most responsible, has plans. Lead surely to abundance. But everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. Do you know what we have a habit of doing? We have a habit of repeating what we see our parents have done, what our siblings have done, uncles and aunts. You know, when I was growing up, uh, we lived in really, really horrible poverty. And so I thought like a poor person. Well, I thought, well, my family's poor. But I didn't know my family. My father used to be the director of the Civic Light Opera. He's the one who moved them into Heinz Hall. Highly intelligent individual. But of course, you know how like cool people, they like socially going out there and partying and he, he was one of that crowd and he became a falling down drunken bum and i'm just that's it that's the bottom line so the reason why we lived in poverty is because he didn't work he'd send my mother out to work and he didn't work and so i did not realize that he had been exiled from his family so here I am, I'm going into ministry, and I'm getting to know my family a little bit, got to meet my grandpa, and then I found out that my grandfather was rich. And then I found out that my family was affluent. And then I found out that they were doctors and jewelers and scientists, and I, I remember my grandpa in 1982, he took me on a little tour of where he lives, and uh, so we're walking around, and I'd met him a few times in my life, but... Because of our family situation, we had been separated. And so uh, he started to tell me, he said, you know, I'm 86 years old and I take home in my retirement $10,000 a month. I was like, in 1982, I mean, that's good money now, right? Imagine what that was in 1982. So he told me how he lived. Well, he had just become a Christian at 86 years of age. So uh, now, at that time, he was not very giving, so he wasn't sharing any of this. But all of a sudden, my belief system started to change. So I had been poor, and I grew up poor. I ate garbage. I slept in the woods. I've told you the story. Right after my wife and I got married, I intro introduced her to dumpster dining because we were hungry. We just got married. We had no money, and we had no food. And it's not that bad. Do not judge me. Do not judge. There's some really good tasting things you can find in there if you go to the right dumpster. I'm just saying that, you know. So I uh, so that carried us through. To, we got our first paychecks, and um, that's why I am the most bizarre pastor in the United States. That's why I have the only story in the United States of a minister who left school and nobody wanted to financially support me. And I said, "Well, I don't care." Because I had learned how to live on a nickel. So I went to Pittsburgh. I moved in a shack. Now, the story's starting to make sense, right? We had electric. We didn't have a bathroom. I had no income. And it was okay. God permitted. And I thank him. He let me go through that when I was a child. Because he was prepping, prepping me. He was training me to do this. And so while I was doing that, I met Grandpa. And so I got to know him for 12 months, and when he was dying, he, I said, what did you do to make really good money? Well, he did several things, but on his dying last breath, he said, I was a landlord. That's all he said. So I told my wife, I said, well, I'm going to do the Lord's work, and I'm going to be like Grandpa, and I'm going to become a landlord. And my belief system 
went from here and jumped up to here. And I thought, wait a minute, that's my family. My family has money. My family does well. My family doesn't struggle. That thing called my dad, okay, like he was a mutation or something. I don't know what he was. So he's out, they're in, and I'm going to become like them. When you believe that you can be here and you don't have to live down here anymore, then this is where you're going to be. Somebody here needs to hear that. Okay, so you, you want to get this training. You want to have a plan. I, I told all my children when they graduated from high school, a man without a plan is not a man. So if you're going to be God's man, then you have to have a plan. Okay, now, uh, most of us do not live by budgets. I want to encourage you to go home today and start on your budget. Now, I know many of you are going to say, well, we don't need a budget. Really? <laughs> really? Hey, let me tell you this. Right now, there's a small percentage of people in the church that don't need a budget. I agree. 75, no, 80% of the entire church right now at this moment, you need a budget. I would dare say that 90% of everyone in church here and down at the cafe, you don't have a budget. Why is a budget important? Again, 35 years ago, I made my first budget. My wife and I made that budget. We live by that budget. Okay, this is really old-fashioned. I do the same thing again. We open up a savings account. Christmas money. Say, we don't have money for Christmas. Really? You spent the money for Christmas. It's on your credit card, and you're still paying for Christmas, okay? Figure out what you're going to spend for Christmas. Keep it modest. You put that in the savings. Even do a modest vacation, you put it in the savings. You buy the kids' clothes to go to school every year, don't you? Put it in the savings. You celebrate birthdays, modestly figure out what you're going to spend on everybody's birthday, and you stick it in the savings. You add it all up, you divide it by 12, let's say it's $300 a month. Once a month, do an automatic transfer or deposit into the savings account. Okay, then you have your monthly bills. Then you have your cash money. Do not charge anything that you don't have to charge. It's all right if you want to charge your gas because you're just going to put the gas in that you need and you pay it off at the end of the month. Get rid of the debit cards. If you're rich and you're wealthy and you don't need a, uh, a budget, then keep your debit cards. If you're part of 80% of the church, get rid of your debit cards. Debit cards for most of us mean, I'm going to live like a haphazard life, and whenever I need money, I just run it through, and I get money out of the checking account. And we think it's okay because it's not going on a credit card. That means I'm not going to follow my budget. If you have a budget, then maybe you have a little allowance each week. We'd have a certain amount of money for food. We stuck it in an envelope. When she go to the store, and she knew she'd keep a calculator with her because she knew what was going to happen. When she got to the register, if she didn't have enough money, what do you do? You just dump your groceries on them, okay? Just leave it there. That's it. So, okay, I can't afford these 20. So you, pay, you figure out what well, $20 of groceries that you can't pay for. You're only going to do that a couple times. And you leave them there, and you go home, and that's how we ran our budget for like 25 years. This works. But here's this family. We had all these kids. Okay, and just so you understand... Do not misread me. I started at the church with no income. They paid me $50 a week. Then I got this really big raise, and I made 100 bucks a week for 60 hours work. Then I went for 20 years, and the first 20 years, I was making like this much money. So I worked 60 hours a week, make a little bit of money for the church, so I had to work on the side. We were on a really, 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 really tight budget, but this is what we did. When it was time for a birthday, we just pulled the birthday money out. When it was time for a vacation, we got the cash out for the vacation. When it came to Christmas, we grabbed the cash for Christmas. What I always did, we had Christmas, and people would say, how did you do this? The day after Christmas, we'd jump in the van, and we would go to Florida on, on a very low-budget vacation, but it was really nice. And people say, your wife is at home. How did you do that? Because we lived on a very strict budget, and the money was always there. Wouldn't that be nice? Okay, but you got to get started somewhere, and I realize that many things start out into a mess. And to make you feel any better, there was one year of transition in which I had to take $20,000 of living expense and stick it on a credit line. I was really ashamed. 
So I know what it's like to get yourself into an awful, horrible rut, but you have to have a plan. Why is this important? Let me ask you, if you went in for a surgery, would you let a surgeon say, well, like, we really don't know what's wrong with you, so what we're going to do, we're, like, going to start cutting you open, and we're just going to kind of look around. We'll just kind of, like, try to fix something. We see something's wrong. Would you do that? Some of you ladies, you're getting married, and the groom, he doesn't understand. He says, like, why do we have to make all these plans? He thinks you just show up at the church, and you get married. Now, some of your weddings have looked like that, but, you know, <laughs> that's not how it works. Okay, why is this important? Let me give you some facts here. This is getting worse every single year. So if you've been listening up to this moment, you can ignore, but I don't want you falling into this category. How are retired people doing? People between 65 years age and 75 years old, 70% of them are struggling with debt. That sounds like a nice retirement, doesn't it? 70% of them still have a mortgage. Why? They got the first mortgage and it went for 30 years. Did you know that most people that purchase the first home are going to purchase the second home? And guess what they do? Somewhere between 35 and 45, they get the second home. And how many years did they put that on a mortgage? 30 years. 1978, 90% of all private sectors for jobs provided a pension. 90%. Today, only 13% of all jobs offer any kind of a pension. You have to be in the union. You may be a teacher. You may be working for the government. Those are the biggest ones that now give pensions. Right now, only 13% of Americans are offered pensions. And those who are having pensions, they're all coming to an end. Oh, but we started this really cool thing. They said, we're going to start 401ks. Worst thing they could have ever done because if you leave it up to the American average person, we're horrible investors, okay? So they said, we're going to do 401ks, and, and then what we're going to do is we're going to match what you're putting in there. Okay, just so you know, right now, we're not talking about the retired crowd. We're talking about those heading for retirement in America. Only 30% of all Americans have a savings or a 401k. Okay, this is really getting scary. This is going to happen overnight in a few, not too many years from now. It's coming. And what I'm telling you here, you listen to us, and the reason why, the teachers aren't teaching the college students, high school students. You know why? Because the teachers are a mess. The college professors aren't teaching it in college because the college professors are a mess. Congress isn't teaching about it, and they're some of the highest paid in America because most of Congress is in a financial mess. The only place you're going to hear it is in the church and from godly believers. So right now, as people are going to retirement, the average retirement income from a pension or a 401k or social security for a couple is $4,000 a month. Average couples together get 22 to, I mean, yeah, 22 to $2,300 a month. If you don't have a pension and you don't have a 401k, how much money are you going to make as a couple? $2,200 a month. That's scary, isn't it? Right now, they're averaging $4,000 a month. At this moment, 25% of all retired people must work until they die. Not full-time, but at least part-time, just to make it with their Social Security. What's going to happen not too many years from now is that 70% of all senior citizens are going to be in a poverty state of income. This is where we're heading. You've got to stop it right now. Some very smart moves, and you can stop it. 63% of all people that are retired right now at this very moment need some sort of help. They need a little bit of charity, or they need family members to give them some help just to make it. Let me take it one more step. 80% of all America right now, they, the, the percentage just went up this year, are living from paycheck to paycheck. Take everyone, Mount Lebanon, Upper St. Clair, take all those rich people you see down there, those gorgeous, beautiful neighborhoods down in Florida, all the professions we have, 80% of America is living from paycheck to paycheck. Very, very sad. Set your savings in investing on autopilot. That's one of your plans. 
set your savings and your investing on autopilot. Let me give you the poor man's plan, okay? So um, I, I, I've taught this to people. In fact, I, I, I was afraid I would get judged. I actually wanted to teach this in a class at the church. I'm still contemplating this, but I'm afraid I'll be judged by the spiritual crowd out there. But um, my, uh, when, I, when I was young, I went into rental work. And the reason why it's not a poor person that can do it if they have good credit. And I found out there, there are people who can't pay their mortgages and or, or, or really struggling, or they moved out of state, or something has happened, or mom and dad died. Listen, do you know there's a mass number of homes that can't be sold because you have to have a home up to a certain level to put it on the market for a bank to give a loan on it? But those people, if you would just come along and make a deal with them, which I've done many times, I say, I'll put this on a 15-year loan. We'll agree on this certain amount of money. I'm giving you no money down. I'm just paying closing costs, and they're going to get a check for the next 15 years. We do it through a lawyer. It's secure. It's safe for everybody on both ends. I say, now, why would you do that? You clear about $150, $200 profit. You just keep the thing going, but you leave the profit in there so you can keep everything running and working. If you have two homes and they're worth $75,000 apiece, in 15 years, you now have $150,000 in 15 years and you can sell them to do whatever, right? Or you can just keep them. I, I like a keeping thing, okay? Because there's profit coming in. Okay, that's just one idea. There's many ideas, many, many good ideas in which you could have. I, I have a guy in the church. I knew he was generous. He tithes to the church. He's a good giver to the capital campaign. I kept looking at him going, I knew what he did. I go, I, I don't get it. So finally one of his kids came across and they said, do you know how generous my dad is? I went, what? So he started to share something with me about something he was helping the children with, and I thought, well, how, how could that be? So one day I'm talking to the dad, and I said, hey, uh, just recently, I said, how do you do this? I know what you do. He laughed. He goes, yeah, he goes, I just have a dumb job. I've just had this okay, okay paying job. My wife has an okay paying job. He goes, you know what the secret was? I said, what? He said, we paid off all our debts in our early 30s. He goes, this is 25 years later. We've never had a car loan. We don't have a house payment. He goes, we don't have credit card payments. He said, do you know how much extra money you have when you don't owe anybody anything? Amen? Okay, put you in a really good position. I said, that makes sense. And he can be very generous. Hey, let, let me give you some kingdom advice. You put Jesus first in your giving. And I mean it. Okay, we walk around. And you say, well, I have faith. I have strong faith. If you don't put God first in your giving, you don't have strong faith. I question what little faith you do have. Now, the reason why I say that, my father owns the cattle on a thousand hills, right? Okay, let me, this is what you do. I believe that you should put God on autopilot. So I have signed up, and we have it there in your bulletin. I'm not here to talk to you about tithing today, but this is a part of it. You can't be blessed and leave God out. So what my wife and I have done, we've signed up for the autopilot giving, and they go in once a month, and we figure out what we give for the entire year. We split up into 12 payments, and on the ninth of each month, they go and grab the money. I want them to do that. I don't want to be bothered with it. Plus, I just don't want to write the check out. I just don't want to do it. Just go get it. Now, we start, and let me show you how this works. Now, I'm putting my money where my mouth is on this one. Okay, so many of you know this story. When we went into the capital campaign, when we went in, we said the pastors were going to lead the way, and all of us were going to greatly sacrificially give to the capital campaign. So um, we did that, and as we went into that, I told the whole congregation, anyone who trusted in the Lord, God is going to bless you in what you give. You're going to be blessed. So all three pastors did it. So I want to be up there with the big guys. So I went up there with some of our people in the church. My wife said, we can't afford to do that. I said, well, if we sell stuff, we could. It's like going in your 401k and grabbing all the money and, you know, a big chunk of it, throw it in there. And I said, well, but I have stuff. And I said, well, we could sell stuff. And she said, but that stuff makes us money. I said, I know, but we're just going to do it. And that's it. So I believe that God answers prayer. Do you believe God answers prayer? And he loves God to challenge him. People, people challenge him. So what I did during the capital campaign, I paced out here for one week between 11 and 12. I made a holy time. And I said, you know what I'm going to do? 
but I'm going to sign that paper. And I will sell this stuff. But you know what? I know you can give me the idea of how to make the money in 36 months. So one night I'm out there praying. I put them on a seven-day time period. I do this all the time. Seven days, I'm going to know what to do. So I, one night, something just came to me in prayer. So I went to Pastor Sam and said, hey, I think God gave me this idea. I began to pray about it. I told Sam ahead of time about it. I delved into it. Now, I'm not done, but I'm coming up to my last payments here soon on the capital campaign. Now, Pastor Sam did something he could not afford to do. His wife, they were going to have... They wanted to have children during that period of time. They ended up having two little kids, and he really wanted her home with the children. And, you know, in today's world, it's really hard to do that. And Okay, let me tell you where this ended up. Pastor Ron, Pastor Sam, now imagine working for a job where they say, hey, just so you know, you guys aren't getting raises for years. I told him that. I said, you're not going to do it. Nobody's getting raises. That's it. But, and we expect you to give to us in a really big way. Okay, that's a bizarre job, right? Okay, so... But this is what we do. So they did it. They fulfilled it. Pastor Ron, Pastor Sam, and Pastor Mike turned out to be very blessed after we were done more than we were than when it started. And we're very thankful we did what we did because that is how our God works. Amen? Okay, go to work. That's the next one. Look at Proverbs 28, verse 19. Whoever works his land will have plenty of bread. Notice that? He says, if you work really hard, you'll have plenty of bread. But he who follows worthless pursuits, worthless pursuits, some of you just need to kind of circle that there, worthless pursuits, will have plenty of poverty. Now, I deal with a lot of poor people, ministry-wise, and what I'm going to say is not, a, is not a popular political thing to say. And the people who are insulted are not the poor people. It's the people that actually work hard, but they have believed in lies about poverty, and I mean lies, and I mean that. So I deal with a lot of poor people through the church, and professionally on this side, I deal with endless army of poor people. So when I'm trying to help somebody money-wise, the first question I have for them is this. Do you have, this is deep, get your pens out. Okay, ready? Do you have a job? I go, what do you mean? I go, well, why aren't you working? <laughs> well, I'm not working for this. I was working for this guy. You know what he made me do? That's below me. I'm not doing that. I'm not working at McDonald's. I'm not working at Burger King. I refuse. I respect myself too much for that. I said, but you don't have any job. And you don't have any income. I, I mean, some income would be better than no income, right? Very, very sad. Some people, you look at them and you, I question myself. Maybe you don't because you're nicer than I am. But then I think, who, who ties your shoelaces for you, you know? Okay, I help a lot of homeless people. Okay, let's talk about the truth about the homeless. Now, of course, there are people out there that mentally aren't doing well, and that's true, extreme cases. Now, I'm not talking about that. So here I, again... I'll tell these stories a lot because we have success stories in the church, but out of 100% of the people I help that are homeless, only 5% turn out well. And here's the reason why. So a guy meets me at the door not long ago and tells me he's homeless. Well, of course, Pastor Ron, Pastor Sam will whisper to me, don't do it. Don't do it. They can see what's going on. Okay, but I can't. You're sleeping outside. This guy's sleeping in a car. He's a young guy. I feel really bad for him. I want to help him. I go, okay, all right, all right. So, of course, I ignore everybody. I move him on the property. I say, now, listen, I'm going to help you. I'm going to work with you. We're going to give you a job. We're going to get you started. I'm going to help you come up with a plan. We're going to get you on a plan of prosperity, and we're going to get you on track. And so I, I, so we, we start that week, and, we, and he's all happy, and he's all excited. Well, six days later, he's sitting in my office, and I have Sam in the office there. I go, now, we got a problem here. Um, you now will not work. And he goes, yeah, there's good reason. And I said, well, why? I wanted Sam in there for the entertainment. Because they don't get to hear this real often. He said, I'm not doing that. I said, why? He said, because I just don't he spiritualize it. Because I'm really close to God. And I just don't feel it. I just don't feel it. He said, now... You know, I got to do something that, that like, like makes me feel good. And 
And I, he goes, you, you guys do these things. He goes, but I'm led by the Spirit of God. I said, well, I don't think it's the Spirit of God, but whatever spirit it is, it's going to lead you out into the cold here today. Do you understand that? He goes, well, I guess, you know, some people have all lucky breaks. I guess I'm going to have to go back outside. And I said, yeah, you are. If you, so we gave him the plan. To, these, okay, well, I'm telling you, that's what goes on all the time. Don't be fooled. Do not be fooled. That's why it's not good just to run around and give handouts. Be sure that we're trying to get these people on track. It's good to feed the hungry. And, but listen, plans don't work unless you do. Plans don't work unless you do. So you got to have a plan. You got to work that plan. You don't get what you wish for. You get what you work for. That's right. Okay, number four, go the extra mile. Proverbs 14, verse 4. Where there are no oxen, the manger is clean. There is no hay, there is no straw. But abundant crops comes by the strength of the ox. You will be blessed by the strength of the ox. Okay, this is really deep. Who, who's the ox? You're the ox. You say to somebody, you're, you're just a big ox. Where well, you are. I hope you're a strong ox. Because uh, studies have proven over the last 50 years... It's not the smarter ones. They've proven every time that those who work harder and those who work uh, longer are the ones that do the best. Just do a little bit better. Just do a little bit more. That's all you have to do. When it comes to going the extra mile, just do a little bit more. So many years ago, I realized I had to work on the side. And, okay, so I'm going to blow my cover on this. What I did up to three years ago. Okay, ready? Because I was a little embarrassed about this for years. I worked three jobs up to three years ago. I quit job number three on uh, the capital campaign. So, um, so what I did on that job, many years ago, I met this lawyer, and he had a big law firm and all this stuff. And so he had a real estate Stuff that was going on totally failed. They were falling apart. It was going into bankruptcy and it was a mess. So me and him made a deal. And I said to him, hey, I can put it up on his feet and I can rebuild it and I can add to it and I can make you all sorts of money. And so he said, well, what do you want? I said, I want 15% of the rents. He said, 15%? He said, that's like double the amount of money that most people ask for. I said, well, I'll work two years free for you. But if I made you that money, you got to catch up with me on the first two years. And then we have a contract from there. I knew he could find ways to get rid of me. Well, I got that whole thing up and running. And you know what? I'm, I'm the best property manager you could ever ask for. Because what I did, I was afraid he would dump me. So I did everything. I did everything. Nobody even knew he existed. So they would call me. We took care, we took care of the repairs. We took care of his taxes. At the end of the year, we would bring to him... All his paperwork to put on his taxes absolutely completed like an accountant had prepared it. He wouldn't get rid of me. Why? Because if you work at a job and you make them feel like they can't live without you, they'll never get rid of you. You'll be promoted. And it was a blessing for all those years with all those kids. God will give you an idea, but you got to go the extra mile. You must pre-decide, pre-determine to be generous to other people and to God. It's time for us to wake up. We came into this world naked and broke. And we're going to leave this world naked and broke. Bill Gates, he might be all dressed up in that coffin, but he's leaving just as broke as he came. And then you have that defining moment in your life. For some of you, you lost your health. You you lost somebody you love. And you were working. Maybe you were working together for all that stuff. And then you came to the place and you thought, I would give. I would give up my home. I, I would give up my savings. I would give up my pension. I would give up everything I had. If I could just have that or have them back. Do you know what I'm saying? And then you look at money, and you say, well, what's the point of it? The point is this. We want to know, we want to do well, because money is to be given away. 
Jesus came into this world. He gave away his life and he hung upon that cross so that we could give, give us eternal life. I will never be like Jesus Christ unless I give my life away. I want you to imagine this summer, you're having this big picnic, you got a nice fence around your yard, and you got the barbecue chicken there, you got the potato salad, you got the chocolate cake, and it's a sunny day, and you're there with your family, and you're enjoying your time. Then you turn around, and all around you are men, women, and children that are hungry and are starving. You're just staring. I don't know about you. I can't enjoy what I have if I'm not sharing what I have with those in need. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, oh Lord, I I pray the series changes our life. I pray, Father, right now, I pray that you would give the hopeless hope. I would pray for those who are in severe debt those who feel as if there is no answer. Oh, Father, we thank you that you are the God that owns the thousand, the cattle on a thousand hills. Oh, Father, we we thank you. We we praise you. We, We thank you, God, what you're going to do. I pray, Father, that you give us an idea. I pray that we would believe because we are the children of God that we can overcome these problems. I pray that we would step out in faith and put you number one. And now, Lord, we thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.